find Romans chapter 7 in your Bibles. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Romans 7, 13. If you don't have a Bible, there's a black book in the rack in front of you, the Pew Bible. It's on page 943 and on into 944. Romans 7, 13 through the end of the chapter. Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, was a man who spent years in uh, prison camps in Russia. He learned a lot there and one of the things he said was that the line dividing good and evil runs through the heart of every human being. The line dividing good and evil runs through the heart of every human being. It, he, he was right and it's really crucial for us to know that that's true. You need to know it about yourself. You need to know it about others. It, it, it kind of helps you in a, in a number of ways. Um, those that don't know Christ still bear his image. And uh, it's important that you remember that sometimes and you'll be struck sometimes by the way that image shows up in those that don't believe in him. Um, also protect you from being so horribly shocked and disillusioned when those who name the name of Christ fail and fall and don't live up to the gospel they preach or profess. It'll help you as you wrestle with these things in your own life that you don't have too much self-confidence and also you're not too quick to despair of your progress. The line dividing good and evil runs through the heart of every human being. I think Paul is uh, describing that for us in Romans chapter seven. Um, this is a text I've wrestled with for years. Um, uh, the wrestling this week didn't put an end to it, I don't think. I expect to wrestle with it uh, for years to come. Um, uh, maybe you've wrestled with it too. But uh, I'm going to read it and then try to preach it. So Romans 7, 13, this is the word of the Lord. Let's honor it by standing together. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Let's pray. Father, would you reveal to us the truth you have for us in these words? 
Would you weaken our confidence in ourselves, in our own strength, in our own ability to overcome sin? Would we despair of hope in ourselves and rest our hope firmly in Christ alone, crucified and resurrected? Do these things in us by your spirit, for your glory, for our good. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You can take your seat. This text is set up much like the text we've been looking at for weeks now. Paul starts with a question, maybe uh, a temptation in those who are reading him or hearing him. Uh, to misunderstand or misapply what he's been saying. Did that which is good then bring death to me? That which is good is what he just described as the commandment or the law is holy and righteous and good in verse 12. So did that good thing, the law, produce death? And he says, no, it didn't by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. And so then after he asks the question, answers it, then he spends the rest of the verses unpacking why that is so, uh, why it is that the law didn't produce death, but rather it was sin producing death in him. Now we're going to look at these verses on four fronts. We'll look at it four ways. The first is what the law can do, what the law can do. And he describes it there in verse 13. Uh, it in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So what the law can do is show your sin. And uh, if you pay attention to the law, it will do that. It'll do it regularly, it'll do it often, it'll do it most every time you open the Bible, you will be confronted with some failure on your own part. Uh, what 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 the law does, what the commandment does is show you the character of God, the goodness of God and the greatness of God, the perfections, of God, it shows you his righteousness. And always, when you see that, you're gonna suffer by comparison. Uh, The righteous law of God will reveal to you your sin. And then, though, not only does he say that sin might be shown to be sin, but might become sinful beyond all measure. That's in your mind's eye, that when you see sin, not only do you see it as sin, but you see it as utterly sinful, as horrible. And this is response when you love God and you love his character and you see the law expressing the good, beautiful, holy, righteous character of God. And then you see your own sin. You see your sin as utterly sinful. On Tuesday night, I tried to preach at the BCM on Isaiah chapter 6. And in this time when the year that Uzziah died and a 52-year reign came to an end, Uh, The Lord gives Isaiah this vision of himself in the temple, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple. And the seraphs are flying around, calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the the thresholds of the the temple shake, and it's filled with smoke. And and Isaiah is undone in the middle of that. He says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. This vision of God that he had brought him to this feeling of being undone in in despair. I, I don't have any hope in myself. I'm a sinful man. My lips are sinful. He's going to be called to be a prophet, to use his lips to the glory of God, and yet he's gripped with the sinfulness of his own lips and the sinfulness of the lips of those around him. That's the way he responds to this vision of God. Well, in the law, that's what you're getting. You're getting a picture of the goodness, the righteousness, the greatness of God. And the response to that is going to be an awareness of sin, an awareness of the sinfulness of sin. And when guys like me stand up with the Bible and preach, one of, one of, one of the jobs of a gospel preacher is to sort of help you see how horrible sin is. It's, it's not fun, but that's, that's the task. If, 
if, if, you, if you have this sort of light and uh, external view of sin, it doesn't run to the core, it's not that deep, and it's bad but not that bad, then you, you never feel how much you need Jesus. And the cross doesn't make any sense because you, you, uh, you don't think your sin's bad enough to demand crucifixion and hell and all of that. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work as long as you're thinking, sin's not that bad, everybody's doing it, it's no big deal. As long as your attitude is that, it, it, you, you, don't, you don't feel a need for Jesus. So what Paul is doing for us is helping us, uh, although it, it feels hard, doesn't it, and difficult. The law can, the law can show your sin. It can show you the sinfulness of your sin. And in this particular case, it's, it, the, the sinfulness of sin is horrible because it can take a good thing, the law, and then use it to produce death. You see that in the very beginning in the temptation narrative of Genesis 3. And uh, it continues to this day. And the law also can condemn you. Not only does it show your sin, show you the sinfulness of your sin, but shows you the righteousness of God, and it tells you that God is the judge of all the earth, and the judge of all the earth will do right. And so if he's the judge of all the earth and he will do right and you're utterly sinful, then what's going to happen? You're going to be in trouble with a good God. You're condemned. You're under the wrath of God. So the law can do that. Show your sin, show you the utter sinfulness of your sin, and tell you you're condemned under the law because you've failed to meet God's demands. That's what the law can do. Second thing, what the law cannot do. What the law cannot do. And really, as you walk through this, these kind of despairing verses here of the Apostle Paul, desiring to do good but not able to do it, desiring to refrain from evil but not able to re refrain the very thing he, he wants to do he can't do the very thing he wants to leave alone he can't leave alone all of that opposition that battle going on inside of him that he's describing there it's it's to help us see that the law can't change us the, the law cannot help us the law tells us what's right but doesn't help us do what's right the the law tells us what's wrong, but it doesn't help us avoid what's wrong. It, it doesn't do it. it. It educates, but it can't, it can't change us. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? I mean, it just, it really is. So, I'm a Murray State fan, and uh, Murray State fans are grieving Ja Morant right now and and you don't know exactly what's going on with Ja but whatever it is it hasn't been good and uh, and you're thinking you got millions and millions and millions of dollars and you're rapidly becoming the face of the NBA and you risk all of that uh, it's it's crazy isn't it and, and, and how do you respond to that? You just, just think horrible of jaw? Or when, when you look at something like that, do you, are you looking in the mirror to some extent? That None of us know how to stand prosperity very well. We, left to ourselves, we are the ruin of ourselves. And the law can't help us. It can just show us where we're wrong and where we're not right, and, and it can condemn us. It can't give us any strength. It can't give us any power. It can't give us any hope. The law can't do any of that. Third thing is what we cannot do. What we cannot do. It's... As you read through the verses, not only is the law powerless to help us, we're powerless to help ourselves. Now, now at this point, we've got to wrestle with the big question of this passage, and it is, um, who exactly are we talking about here? So, 
this feels autobiographical, doesn't it? Because the Apostle Paul's talking that way. He's saying I and me and that kind of thing. So he seems like he's talking about himself. But he's talking about himself when? Is he talking about himself before he was converted? Before he was born again? And he's given us the despair of an unbeliever. Is he talking about himself after he's been born again? And what he's describing here is the present experience of someone who's in Christ. Some have gone a different route. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it's neither one. It's an awakened sinner. It's someone who's, who's uh, been confronted with the gospel and the law of God. He's been awakened to the reality of his sin, but he's not yet converted. He's not yet born again. He's sort of in an in-between place. And if you nail Lloyd-Jones down, he's got to admit this is an unbeliever, uh, but not merely that, an awakened one who's hopefully on the road to, to new life in Christ. So which is it? And if we polled the crowd, at least those of you that have thought deeply about Romans chapter 7, uh, you might have an equal group on each side. And it's hard to figure it out. It really is. Uh, the, the stuff that Paul's been saying to us in Romans 6 and the stuff that he will say to us in Romans 8 feels so hopeful and wonderful and glorious as far as the power of the believer to overcome sin and make progress in the faith, to really live a life that honors God. You see that in chapter 6 and you see that in chapter 8, and then you get this despair in chapter 7, and so you want to say this can't be the experience of someone who's a believer. And yet, when I think about my own life, and the battle that is waged within me relentlessly. I, I want to think these verses are about a believer because I want to think that I'm a, I'm a Christian you know, and I can identify with the horror of this struggle. I want to do right, but so often I don't. and I, I don't want to embrace what's evil, but so often I do. And when you, when you look at the passage of Scripture, you see, you see some things that line up on one side and some things that line up on, on the other. If you're persuaded this can't be Paul as a, as a redeemed Christian in Christ, well, if that's true, then how is it that he delights in the law of God and his inner being? I mean, do you find a lot of people that haven't trusted in Christ as Savior that really delight in the law of God and their inner being? That seems like something that would would be indicative of a, of a believer, someone who's in Christ. And if it's not a believer, why did he change to present tense there? Why did, why did we have that shift? But I am of the flesh sold under sin. Verse 14, I do not understand. It shifted from past tense to present tense right there in verse 14. And so it seems like Paul's writing the letter. He's writing in present tense. This must be his present experience. So, present tense, he delights in the law of God, the experience of ourselves. And, and yet there's other stuff that sounds like it couldn't be a believer. I mean, do believers really have no ability to do what's right and no capacity to do what's wrong? Would, would a believer say of himself, wretched man that I am? Would a believer say of himself, Who will deliver me from this body of death? When you read the Apostle Paul in other places, do you hear him talking like that? And, and, and when you take the things that seem to be describing a believer and you put them on one side of the scales and you take the things that seem to be describing someone who's an unbeliever and you put them on the other side of the scales, they, they, they just almost balance. So what's Paul up to? Is he trying to confuse us? And you can make strong and substantial arguments on either side of this question, and you can make strong and substantial arguments for the, for the middle road, awakened sinner but not yet converted. You can make strong arguments for all three. So why would the Apostle Paul do this? 
Well, you may not be satisfied with my answer, but I'm going with Tom Schreiner on this one. And Tom says, Paul didn't intend to make a distinction here. He, he didn't intend to distinguish between believers and unbelievers and between the awakened or the unawakened. He doesn't intend that. I, I'm inclined to agree with him. All of us need to know what we cannot do apart from the grace of God. We cannot do what's right and we cannot shun what's wrong. Apart from the grace of God, we're not able to do that. If you're an unbeliever, that's absolutely true of you. And, and, and what this text is designed to do for you is to show you what you cannot do, that, that you cannot lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, that, that you're not going to be able to do it. You need to despair of your capacity to overcome sin and to embrace a righteous life. You need to give up on that project. You, you can't do it. Back in the fourth century, there was a debate between two men. Uh, one was a guy named Pelagius, and the other was a guy named Augustine. You might have heard of this second one. Uh, Pelagius was a British monk, and uh, Augustine was a North African bishop. And, and they were arguing over this very thing. Pelagius believed that we were good enough to choose right and shun wrong. And if you just tried hard enough, you, you could do it. And Augustine believed that was absolutely wrong. That the only way anything like that would happen would be by the sheer and utter grace of God. And the church went with Augustine in the short run. In the long run, I'm not so sure. And in a debate that's over 1,500 years old is really waged in every generation. Will we be a people of grace or will we lapse to be a people of works that somehow we have this capacity to do it I can choose the right and I can walk in the right and I can shun evil I can do it if I just try hard enough if I just discipline myself enough then I'm able to do it Romans 7 says no It also says no to the unbeliever, lest we somehow think, well, I'm converted, I'm born again by the grace of God, but, but when it comes to my progress in the faith, I'll make progress in the faith by my own discipline, effort, work, all of that. Now, we have to be careful here because being born again is effortless. You make no contribution to being regenerated. You do not do it, at least in my belief. You make no. But you do make an effort to your sanctification. You do put forth effort, and you're supposed to. But you don't do it trusting in your own effort and your own ability. You put forth effort, but your effort is trusting somewhere else. Have you, have you come to the place that you've despaired of your own ability to do good and not do wrong, and by that effort, make yourself acceptable to God. Have you given up on that? If, if you're not a Christian, but you haven't given up on that, then you, you really, really need to. You, you need to give up on your own ability to make yourself right with God. You, you'll, you'll never do it. And if somehow you convince yourself that you are doing it, you'll become self-righteous and proud and and, and somehow, if you convince yourself that you're not doing it at all, even though you're trying hard, you may just despair horribly. I'd rather you despair than got self-righteous because the despair could lead you to a good place. But, and those of you that do know Jesus, you have experienced this miracle. You have, by his grace, repented and believed the gospel. 
Have you somehow lapsed into this imagination that, that you can make yourself a great and godly Christian by sheer effort, by just embracing the disciplines? You just try harder and work harder, and if you would do more, then you would be right and good. Have you lapsed into that notion? Romans 7 says you can't do it. It shows you that clearly and, and horribly. So have you, have, you, have you gotten to the place that we talked about last week? R.C. Sproul, Ecclesiastes 11.3. When a tree falls, whether to the north or the south, there it lies. As you drove through the neighborhoods this week and you saw the uprooted trees just laying over, no capacity to right themselves. Could you, can you see yourself there? The law can do some things. It can show you your sin. It can show you how horrible it is. It can show you the condemnation of God for your sin, but the law cannot help you overcome evil and embrace good. And you cannot help yourself overcome evil and embrace good. Paul says, I'm a captive to sin. Fourth thing, what only Jesus can do. What only Jesus can do. At the end of it all, Paul cries out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, you see, all of this despair produced by Romans 7 is to cast you on Christ and Christ alone. That's what it's designed to do. Until you give up on the law's ability to make you right, of your own ability to make you right, until you give up on that, you'll never see your need of Jesus. You'll never see your sin is bad enough to deserve crucifixion and hell. You'll never see it that way. I'm just as good as anybody else. I'm not that bad. It, it'll, it'll always be that. But if you can see in yourself the reality of Romans 7, then you can give up on this self-improvement project and you can cast yourself on the grace of God in Christ, which is exactly what you need. Not that one day you stand before God on your own record, but you stand before God on Christ's record. His perfect righteousness imputed, reckoned, credited to you, to your account. And all your demerits, all your sin, all your rebellion, all your transgression, all of that removed, taken away, paid for, because Jesus paid for it on the cross. He shed his blood that your sins could be washed away. He bore the wrath of God in your place so that you wouldn't have to. And so the dying love of the Savior is the way the mercy of God shows up in your life and forgives you and justifies you and sets you right with God. But then not only that, there's power in the blood. It, it begins to transform you and change you. You put forth effort, but it's an effort relying on Christ and who he is and what he's done. And that Christ who died for sins on the cross under the wrath of God, crushed beneath our heavy load, was buried. But on the third day, he rose again. Death couldn't hold him. And so we worship not just a dying Savior, and we certainly don't worship a dead Savior, but we worship a Savior who died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. But a Savior who rose on the third day, who swallowed death, who's alive Savior who will strengthen you, will help you. So the real key to Romans 7 is giving up on your self-improvement project and, and looking to Jesus, looking to him. We began this service with words from Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2, didn't we? And it talked about the sin that clings so closely to us. 
And then it exhorted us to something. What were we to do? To fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher and finisher of our faith. And as we do that, we run with endurance the race set before us. We do run, but we do run with our eyes fixed on Christ. We do run with our hearts trusting in Christ. And when the realities of Romans 7 show up in your life, and they, they will, probably sooner rather than later, when they do, you cry out to him, O oh, wretched man that I am, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You call on him, you ask him to, to help you. We have a Savior who loves us, and a Savior who understands A little earlier in Hebrews, listen to what it says. Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So when we come to him, in the middle of this battle, feeling like we've been beaten for the umpteenth time what do we expect to get from him what's wrong with you can't you do any better than that I mean I died so that you do better than that what's what's wrong with you is is that what we get no we get a savior who sympathizes who has mercy Come to me all who weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly. and You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A little bit later in Matthew's gospel, bruised reed. He will not break a smoldering wick. He will not snuff out. What'd you do when your, what'd you do when your kids stumbled and fell you know you've got a 11 month old finally getting tired of crawling and deciding she wants to walk and she takes two or three steps and then she falls what 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 are you doing there what's wrong with you honey get up on your feet that's ridiculous stop falling down Is that what you do? No. Come on. You can do it. Take another step. I'll help you up. Let's try again. I mean, that's that's what you do. You think you're a better parent than he is? A better father? Or as Romans 8 says it, a better big brother? No, he'd be cheering you on. I died and rose that you would win this victory. Rely on me. I'm under the yoke with you. I'm pulling with you. Ask me for strength. I'll give it to you. You just got to cry out like a a little child, aware of your need, aware of your weakness. Ask him to help you. Call on him to do it. For, for, For some of you, it's the... It, it, it's what you need to do right now. You've never done it before. You're, you've been relying on yourself all your life, thinking that you could do it, that you could do good, that you could do better. And for the first time in your life, you need to call on Him. And I would just say, pray. Talk to Him. Tell Him about your sin and your struggle. Tell him about your failures. Confess and admit your sin to him. Tell him you believe that he died for you, that he rose from the grave. Trust. Your sins are forgiven. Tell him. Ask him to give you new life. 
It's the only way to find hope. It's the only way to find life. It's the only way to come out of this body of death that Paul is describing here. Call on him and ask him to give you new life. Why, why, would, you, why would you not? And we've been walking through Romans for months. And Paul has been giving us the condition of humanity. He's been relentless at it, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, after verse after verse. We've been looking in the mirror of our own sin so that we would despair of our own ability to make ourselves right with God. When you look at how messed up the world is and you look at how messed up you are, can you still disagree with his assessment? Can you still be saying, no, I think we're better than that. And no, I know I'm better than that. Really? These verses are designed to humble us. I've said this to you many times and I'll say it again. Read the gospels. Read every one of them, start to finish. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And just ask yourself, as you read, how does Jesus treat the proud? And how does Jesus treat the humble? How does he relate to the self-righteous who believe they're good in and of themselves, that they can keep the law on their own? How does he relate to them? How does he relate to those who are broken in their sin and know what they are? I challenge you to do it. Don't take my word for it. Pick out any of the four or read all of the four with that question in mind. And a hundred percent through every story and every teaching and every occasion, you see an absolutely consistent pattern. Those who are confident in their own righteousness, Jesus is severe with them. Those who are broken in their own sin and aware of their need, he is nothing but mercy and grace to them. The Bible is absolutely consistent on it. Jesus is absolutely consistent on it. And the Apostle Paul is absolutely consistent with Jesus. Will you believe him? And call on him. And those of you that do know him, will you engage the battle again? So, so you can come from a you, you can come away from these verses despairing of yourself, but really not hoping in Christ either, really not all that hopeful in Christ. I mean hoping in Christ for your justification, but not hoping in Christ for any real change. And so you just sort of give up on the on the fight. You, you just sort of fell into this detente with sin. My sin's no worse than anybody else's. It's bad, but it's not that bad. And, I've been trying to beat it all this time, and I never really have, so I don't think I ever really will. And so I'm just going to rely on the grace of God to get me to heaven when I die, but I'm not going to expect any, any progress. And you've laid down your sword and shield, but not down by the riverside. You, you're not near the riverside, but you already laid it down, and you're not to do that. And so you engage this battle by calling on the Christ who died and rose. And realizing that in the same gospel that saved you, there's power to overcome. That somehow you have been crucified with Christ. And so you're dead to sin and dead to the law's power over you. You're, you're dead to all of that. And you've come alive to righteous living and alive to God. Those realities that saved you are the realities that will enliven you in the fight now. So look to him, a, a dying Savior. Look to him to kill the sin that remains. Look to him to come alive to him more fully in, in your life. Make confession of sin part of your arsenal. There, there's, there's something about, there's really something about um, confession of sin that disarms the enemy's power. There, there really is. It, it, somehow when you just take it out of the secrecy of your own heart and the, the privacy of your own life and you, and you set it on the table out in the light of day for not just you to see, but others to see. It, it, part of the hook, part of the power of it is the secrecy of it. If you confess to a brother, you confess to a sister, I'm struggling with this, I've failed in this way, would you pray for me? 
Would you help me? It, it's a tool in your arsenal and it ought to be used. It ought to be used frequently and often. Whether you're a leader or a brand new Christian, confess your sin. You ought to have some fighter verses. You ought to have some things you can fight with. And you ought to rely on the Holy Spirit in all of this. The Holy Spirit won't, he won't call attention to himself. He'll, he'll point you back to Christ. That's really his job, not to, not to have you drawn to him as much as have you drawn to Jesus. But you rely on the Spirit and he'll show you Christ. And you trust in him. Later on in chapter 8, he's going to tell you that we kill sin in the power of the Spirit. That's the way we do it. But... We do it relying on Jesus. And we rely on what Christ has done, died and rose so that we can die to sin and live to God, but also what he's doing right now. He's advocating for us. He's pulling for us. He's interceding for us. Right now, he's pulling for you. And when you're, when you're in the middle of the battle with sin, you, the thought that we sing often, upward I look and see him, there who made an end to all my sin that vision will strengthen you in the fight you have verses to fight with when you're struggling with anxiety be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Not just what to do, but why and how and the promise related to it. Deuteronomy 33, 25, and as your days, so shall your strength be. Or the great promises we have surrounding this text. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. You need to have verses to fight with when you're in the battle that you can call to mind. The Holy Spirit will remind you and help you, and you can use those to strengthen you. One I learned as a nine-year-old boy in Sunday school, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The verses I learned when I was nine, I learned in the King James, not so much in recent decades, but there are promises all over this book that will strengthen you and help you to overcome in the battle. But you're not relying on your own strength. You're relying on his. So whether you're not in Christ, and the next step with you is the first step of repentance and faith, or, or whether you've been in Christ a long time, but Somehow you just laid down your sword and the next step for you today is to pick it up again and fight for your own soul and fight for the glory of Christ who died that you would be his. Let's pray. Lord, we see that we need your help. So as we engage the battle again, would you strengthen us by your spirit? You not only died and rose, but you ascended to the Father's right hand. And from there, you poured out your spirit so that you would not just tell us how to live and you would not just die so that we could be forgiven, but your spirit would live in us to strengthen us in the fight. So, Lord, give us hearts that turn to you right now, despairing of self and sin, and with simple childlike trust in you. May we rest as you hold us fast. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.